Video one of chapter nine. This chapter, we are going to be discussing hypothesis testing or significance testing. Now, Mr. G claims 75% of the time he can solve a Rubik's cube in under 75 seconds. To test this claim, a random student is selected every day for 50 days to scramble a Rubik's cube. Students time Mr. G as he solves it. Mr. G can solve the Rubik's Cube in under 75 seconds in 30 of the 50 days for a 60% success rate. Now, Mr. G said he could do it 75% of the time, but he really only did it 60% of the time. Now, 60% is less than 75%, but is it so far less that we're going to doubt Mr. G's claim? So either, number one, Mr. G can do it 75% of the time, but maybe he was just off on some of those days. Or maybe the truth is, number two, he's not telling the truth, that he really can't do it 75% of the time in 75 seconds or less. Now, this chapter is going to focus on a claims likeliness versus a more likely alternative. And the initial claim is called the null hypothesis, or H0. Now, you will see this little O, or maybe, a, maybe sometimes it'll look like a zero, but this is just a subscript, and the null and the zero really represent the same thing. So, H sub null or H sub not is what you might also hear it referred to. Uh, and the null hypothesis always uses an equal sign. We're going to say our null hypothesis is that initial claim and that it always equals a particular value. So when Mr. G said that he could do it 75% of the time, we're going to say the null hypothesis is the proportion of the times that he can solve the Rubik's Cube in under 75 seconds is equal to 75%. Now, the alternative claim is called, shocker, the alternate hypothesis, and it's H sub A. Now, the alternate hypothesis is going to use some sort of uh, inequality, basically. Um, we could be talking about a situation in which we think the truth is greater than the claim, or there's going to be times where we think it's less than the claim. Or there might be times where we don't really know which direction the alternate claim should go compared to the initial null hypothesis claim. So we might just state, we don't believe that the initial claim is this particular value. We'll just say it's not equal to it. Now, in the scenario that Mr. G is not telling the truth, really there could be one of two signs we could use here. And we could just say that it's not equal to um, but that leaves the possibility that Mr. G really could do it in more than 75% of the time. Now, I would imagine that people would be like, ah, 75%, that sounds like a lot. I bet it's less than that. So we're initially just going to go with uh, the alternate hypothesis that the true proportion of the times is less than 75%. So how likely is a 60% success rate when we really expected to see a supposed 75% success rate? Now, later this chapter, we're going to learn how to actually calculate this probability. But for now, we're going to use a simulation just like we did in Chapter 7. So I have a simulation that's already been completed here and a simulation of 50 SRS is each based on a sample size of 50 days is carried out using the claim that 75% is really the truth. So we're always assuming from the beginning that the null hypothesis really is true. And what we're going to try to do is prove that the null hypothesis is not likely to be true. So each of these dots represents like the one situation that happened in which 60% um, of the 50 solves resulted in Mr. G solving the Rubik's Cube in under 75 seconds. So each of these dots represents like another 50 days and another 50 days and another 50 days. And we can see uh, based on this simulation that, you know, hey, there's this one time where 92% of the time Mr. G solved the Rubik's Cube 92% of the time in less than 75 seconds. And then we also see there are times where we're down in the upper 50s, maybe lower 60s. Now, how likely is that 60% success rate or less when we expected to see a 75% success rate? 
So what we do is we look at that 60%, and this is where I know some people back in chapter seven were confused, like why don't we just count this one value? And we can't just count that one value when we're doing a legitimate probability because the probability of an exact one value really has no probability to it. So in this situation, we have to give that 60% a little bit more weight to it. So we're gonna go 60% or less. And you might ask, why or less? Why not or more? Well, it's all about on which side of the claim that we are currently at. So 75% was the claim, which should be the center of this sampling distribution. And so 60% is already to the left side or the lesser side. So we want to look at all of these situations in which we're at 60% or technically less than 60%. We're finding the area of that tail end down here. Now notice there are only two situations in which we were at 60% or less. So our simulated probability would be two out of 50, which would give us 4%. So that probability, that 4% that we just calculated, in chapter seven, we called it just a simulated probability because it was based on a simulation, but another term that we could call it is a p-value. Now, in this scenario, that was really a simulated p-value because it was based on a simulation. Later this chapter, we'll actually discuss how to legitimately calculate the p-value. Now, what does the p mean in p-value? literally means probability value. So the p-value is the probability value. Now, the p-value is defined as a statistical measure used to determine the likelihood that an observed outcome is the result of chance. So how do we interpret a p-value or a probability value? Well, it first starts off assuming that the null hypothesis is really true. So we're always gonna assume that we are being told the truth. And what we're gonna to try to do is prove that the claim being told to us is either likely to be true, or maybe it's not likely to be true. But we're always starting off with that the null hypothesis is in fact true. Then seeing a sample proportion of whatever you saw, or less, or more, depends again on which side of the distribution you're on. Since I was at 60% and that was already on the uh, left side of the distribution, then I would say then seeing a sample proportion of 60% or less. Now, if what I saw was to the right of 75%, then I would have said a sample proportion of that decimal or more from an SRS, and again, hopefully it's from an SRS or a random sample, and then tell me what that sample size is. So in our scenario, it would have been N equals 50. And then would occur approximately whatever that p-value percent was of the time purely by chance. So we're saying there's no craziness going on here, there's no tomfoolery, but the probability that we calculated is really just by pure chance um, if the null hypothesis is in fact, true. So what does that look like for our Mr. G problem? So assuming Mr. G, uh, that his 75% success rate is true, that was the null hypothesis, that P equals 75%. Then seeing a sample proportion of 60% or less from an SRS of N equals 50, because we're just going back to that one instance where there were 50 days and we saw that 60% success rate. We're not considering that simulation again where there were 50 sets of 50 days. We're just considering that one uh, sample that we saw, that we actually saw occur. Would occur approximately, we got 4%. Remember it was two instances out of 50. That is equal to 4% of the time purely by chance. So that p-value represents the evidence that we have against the null hypothesis. And the less likely the event occurs, the more likely the null hypothesis is wrong. I feel like it was this idea right here that was really stumping people uh, back in chapter seven when we talked about sampling distributions, because I felt like people thought that if an event were more likely to happen, then it's more likely to be wrong. But it, it's actually the other way around. The less likely the event occurs, really the more likely that our initial claim, the null hypothesis, is incorrect.
So at what point does the evidence, our p-value, make us statistically believe that the null hypothesis is likely wrong? And so we need a level here. We need something uh, to balance our p-value against or to compare our p-value against. And so we call that the significance level or the alpha level. So you're going to see the Greek letter, lowercase Greek letter, alpha being used here commonly. Now, if you remember previously, we always kind of said 5% or less was that cutoff from being statistically surprised and being statistically not surprised. And this is that same idea here, except we're now going to give it an official name. So Commonly, 5% is that significance or that alpha level, but really it could be any value, okay? It doesn't have to be 5%. Sometimes it'll be 1%. Sometimes we'll see it be 10%. Uh, so 1, 5, and 10 are pretty common alpha levels, but really it could be anything you want it to be. So the initial conclusion that we're going to make with our p-value comparing it to our significance or our alpha level. So if the p-value is less than the alpha level, basically we see a statistically surprising event because what we saw does not happen that often. And if it's less than that alpha level, if it's 5%, then what we're going to do is reject the null hypothesis. But if our p-value is not less than the alpha, and a lot of times people will say, well, can I just say greater than instead of not less than? And you certainly can. But I always just want to remember it as, is it less than or is it not less than? And that's how I kind of keep that straight in my head. But again, if the p-value is greater than the alpha or if the p-value is not less than the alpha value, then we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. We don't really have enough evidence there to reject the null hypothesis. Now, I'm going to use a court case scenario here uh, to think about rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. So let's say the null hypothesis is the defendant is innocent, right? Anytime anybody is taken to court, the defendant is always presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. So the alternate hypothesis would be that they're not innocent, aka that they're guilty. So we're always going to assume that the, that the defendant is telling the truth and that they are really innocent of the crime. Now, if our evidence in the court case, which is going to represent the p-value, if you will, if it's smaller than our tipping point, which is that significance level, then we're going to feel like, hey, uh, there's no way that this dude is innocent of this crime. So we are going to reject his innocence and proclaim him guilty. But if we find that our evidence isn't enough uh, to outweigh our tipping point, then we fail to reject his innocence and we claim that he is not guilty. Now, are there times in our court system where people are found guilty and they find out years later they really weren't guilty? And are there times where defendants are uh, claimed to be not guilty and we find out years later that they were in fact guilty? Absolutely. And so we're going to talk about later this chapter, towards the end, potential errors that can be made whenever we do a hypothesis test or a significance test. We could be wrong and we might not know it. Now, my initial conclusion with my 4% p-value is, and this is if I use a 5% significance level. So if my p-value is 4% and it's smaller than the alpha of 5%, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Now, some of you might go, but what if I said the alpha level was 1% instead? Then the p-value would not be less than the significance level. And you could certainly do that. And then you would just claim that you would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So I will say it does get a little sticky whenever you know what the p-value is. You really already need to have the alpha or significance level set. You can't just look at your p-value and then let the alpha value be whatever you want it to be. Because then really you get to decide whether you're going to reject or fail to reject. And really that's not statistically fair. Now the p-value conclusion. This is what we're always really going to do at the very end of our significance test. Is we're going to have to write a concluding statement. Just like we did with confidence intervals last chapter. But the 
conclusion, the written conclusion, is always going to refer to the alternate hypothesis, that H sub A. It's always going to refer to the alternate. Why? Well, we're always wanting to show that the alternate is maybe the truth. We're going to go with initially that the null hypothesis is the truth, and the alternate is what we really want to show is true. We want to show that the null isn't, in fact, the truth, and that there's some other truth. Now, one of two situations that's going to happen. We might say, because the p-value is less than alpha, that we do have convincing evidence that the alternate hypothesis is, in fact, the truth. And remember, when we say the p-value is less than alpha, we're really saying we're rejecting the null hypothesis. And if we reject the null hypothesis, we want to go with the alternate. So if we reject the null, we're saying we do have convincing evidence. We do have statistically significant evidence that the alternate, and again, when I say the, uh, the conclusion is always in reference to the alternate hypothesis, we are always going to be talking about the alternate here. And you might go, okay, well, that's great when we do have evidence for the alternate, but what happens when the p-value is not less than the alpha? Well, I'm so glad you asked. If the p-value is not less than the alpha, then we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means we can't necessarily go for the alternate. So then we would state that we do not have convincing evidence that, and then you tell me what the alternate hypothesis is in context to the problem. So if we reject the null hypothesis, we do have convincing evidence that the alternate is likely to really be the truth. And if our p-value is not less than our alpha level, then we fail to reject the null. And then we don't have convincing evidence that maybe, in fact, the alternate is the truth. So what's that look like for our Mr. G problem? Well, because the p-value was, in fact, smaller than the alpha, then we do have convincing statistical evidence that Mr. G's success rate is probably, in fact, less than 75%. So this is that alternate hypothesis in context to the problem, right? The alternate was really p is less than 0.75. Well, what does that mean in context? You can't just tell me we do have convincing evidence that p is less than 0.75 or is less than 75%. That gives me no context. Give me the context because you need the context on the AP exam questions. Now, I have a you do problem for you guys to try out. And now, instead of solving Rubik's Cubes, Mr. G is going to play some basketball. So Mr. G claims to be an 80% free throw shooter. But his students believe there's no way it's that high. So a hypothesis test or a significance test is performed, and the p-value is calculated to be 0 0.09 or 9% at an alpha level of 0.05 or 5%. All I want you to do for this you do problem is just interpret what does that 9% really mean in this problem. Now, you might need to consider what is the null hypothesis and what is the alternate hypothesis based on these first two statements here in order to successfully fully uh, to interpret that p-value in the context of the problem. And we'll go over that the next time in class.